Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young woman tells you that her mother has disappeared. There's no trace of her whereabouts. Foul play is suspected. Your job, investigate. First, we read you the six months report. Then the eight months report. Now, here is ten full months of scientific evidence on smoking Chesterfields. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over ten years. After ten full months, almost a year now, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. And Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. Fine tobaccos, the world's best. Costly moistening agents to keep them always tasty, always fresh. And the finest cigarette paper money can buy. Yes, everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette. And it's the only cigarette that gives you this scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfield today. They're best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 5th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.46 a.m. when we got to 4298 North Estrella Street. The front door. Hot. Yeah, it sure is. Yes, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Randall, Ella Randall. Mm-hmm. Did she say what this was about? I just said that her mother disappeared. She wanted to talk to us about it. Uh-huh. Yes? Ms. Randall? Yes, that's right. Police officers, ma'am. Oh, yes, come in, won't you? Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. warm out. I, I think I'll leave the door open. Hope the flies don't come in. My name's Friday, Mrs. Randall. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Uh, how do you do? How do you do, ma'am? Could you tell us just what it is you want to see us about? Well, of course. Sit down, won't you? Uh, thank you, Miss Randall. Would you like some tea or something? I have some ready in the kitchen. No, thanks. Just what was it about your mother, Mrs. Randall? Now that you're here, I guess maybe I could be wrong about it. I was so sure. Well, just what is it, ma'am? Well, Mama's gone. I don't know how long it's been, but she isn't with Papa. Well, what's your mother's name, Ms. Randall? Bertha. Bertha Schroeder, my father's Henry. Uh Uh-huh. What makes you think there might be something wrong? You said on the phone that you were pretty sure that something had happened to her. Well, yes, I guess I ought to start at the beginning. It's kind of a dull story, but maybe it's the best way. All right, ma'am. You sure you wouldn't like a glass of iced tea? No, thanks, ma'am. Thanks, just the same. (laughs) Mind if I get some? Just take a minute. All right. Hey, it's a nice place, huh? Yeah, it is. Sure decorated nice. Hey, look at those trivets. What? Trivets. Those little things over the fireplace, those brass Oh, yeah, yeah. Faye's been wanting some of those. Used to use them to hold irons, you know. They get hot and you put them on the ironing board so they won't burn the cloth. Put them on those things. Yeah. I brought a couple extra glasses in case you decided you wanted some. Well, if you just go ahead with the story, Miss Randall. Yes, well, to understand it, really, you'd have to know Papa. Mm -hmm. He came over to this country when he was just a boy, only about 16 or so. Landed here and couldn't speak more than a dozen words of English. Went to work in New York. Worked as a construction man. Worked hard. Met Mama there and they got married. Right after that, they moved out here. Bought a house and Papa went into business for himself. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe it was the life he'd had when he got here, I don't know, but he always treated Mama like she was so much dirt, mean. Time went on, he got meaner to her. Remember when us kids were in school, he used to yell at her all the time. He'd get in the mood and he wouldn't talk to any of us for days at a time. Is that so? 
I never knew how Mama took it. She never said anything. Just stand there and let him scream at her. And when he was finished, she'd just kind of shrug her shoulders and take his kids out of the house, walk around for a while, and then go back to the house. By that time, Papa was so mad he wouldn't talk to anyone. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Well, all of us kids married young. I got married when I was 16. The rest of the kids weren't much older than that. Papa didn't want us around after that. He said for us to get out and make our own way. He said that we had to. So there's no reason that we shouldn't. <clears throat> You, you sure you don't want some of this? No, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Would you well, mind going ahead, Ms. Randall? Yeah, yes. A, a couple of months ago, I tried to call Mama. The operator told me that the phone had been disconnected. Beg your pardon? I, uh, the operator told me that the phone had been disconnected when I tried to get hold of Mama. I see. Now, I waited a couple of days. You know, I figured that maybe she'd call me. Yes, ma'am. Well, she didn't. You see, once we were out of the house, none of us went back. Papa's retired, and none of us wanted to see him. It's a terrible thing to say, Mr. Friday, but it's true. Ma'am? We all hated him, all of us kids, for what he'd done to us, the beatings and all, but most for what he'd done to Mama. She was only 52, and she looked like she was 92. It was terrible the way he treated her. I see. And like I said, we'd never go over there, but Mama come to see us whenever she could. She'd come over, visit for a little bit, you know, talk about the kids and things. Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't hear from her, and I got a little worried that maybe she was sick. If she was, I, I know that Papa wouldn't tell us, so I went over to the old house, and I rang the bell. I was kind of braced because I thought I'd see Papa, and there'd be an argument, but there wasn't. Ma'am? No argument. Oh. Papa didn't answer the door. Some young woman answered it, and I asked if I could see Mrs. Schroeder. And right away, I knew there was something wrong. Well, how was that, ma'am? Well, I could see inside the front door. The living room had all been changed around. There was new furniture. It looked like the walls had been painted, too. Mm -hmm. What did the woman say when you asked for your mother? She said they didn't live there anymore. Said that they'd, they'd rented the house, you know, and that they'd been living there for the past month. Mm-hmm. Well, at first, I, I don't think I believed her. I asked her who rented the house to her, and she said Papa did. Then I asked her where he was. What'd she say to that? Well, she gave me his address. I went over there to talk to him. It was a little tiny apartment just off La Brea. He said that Mama was gone. I asked him where she'd gone, and he said that she was on a vacation. Mm-hmm. Well, I know him well enough to know that he'd never let her go away. Be no one to darn his socks and keep the house clean. Yeah? I wanted to know where she'd gone in this vacation. He said back to the old country. Said she wanted to see her family. He said that they'd gotten a letter from her sister that she was sick and, and wanted to see Mama. Uh -huh. Well, right then I called him a liar, told him right to his face that he was lying. I kind of thought that he'd hit the ceiling, but he didn't. He just smiled and said that I had no call to say anything like that. He asked me why I said it. Well, what was that? You thought that he'd hit what? Well, I thought that he'd hit the ceiling when I oh, said I that see. to him, yes, when I called him a liar, I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. I told him that if Mama had left, she'd have written, maybe not to me, but to one of the kids. I, I called around, and when I didn't hear from her, none of the kids had either. They were all worried about her, too. I see. Well, what did he say to that? He said he couldn't understand it, so that he'd gotten the letter, that he'd gotten it not more than a day or so before, that she'd arrived safe and was having a wonderful time. This was a letter? Huh? Yes, this was a letter he got from Mama. Well, I told him I thought he was lying, and he said that he'd show me the letter. Well, did he? Well, yeah, he showed, he showed me the letter, but he wouldn't show me the envelope, just the letter. He said he'd thrown the envelope away. Well, was the letter from your mother, ma'am? Well sort of from the words it was, told all about her trip and how she was enjoying herself, said that she was with her sister and that she was getting better, and then she went on to tell how much she missed Papa and all. Uh-huh. Well, right away I could tell that it wasn't Mama's handwriting. She never wrote that letter. Beg your pardon? I said that I knew it wasn't Mama's writing on that letter. Yeah, well... Well, that's when I thought about calling you. Then later I remembered something, and then I made up my mind about calling you. Well, what was that, Ms. Randall? Well, Mama only had one sister living. She died three years ago. <laughs> 11.13 a.m., we continued to talk to Ella Randall. She told us that she was sure that her mother would not have gone off of her own free will. She said that when she last saw Mrs. Schroeder, she appeared to be in good health and in good spirits. We got the names and addresses of the other children in the Schroeder family. We also got the address of the Schroeder relatives in Europe. Ellen Randall told us that we could find her father at the apartment, and she gave us the address. 12.15 p.m. Frank and I drove over to see him. This is ridiculous, subtly ridiculous. Well, maybe so, sir, but we'd like to see the letter that came from your wife. We could. Uh, uh, officer, I'd like very much to show it to you. Really, I would, but I can't. Why not, sir? For the reasons that I haven't got it anymore. I destroyed it, burned it a couple of days ago. Who's your wife staying with, sir? It was her sister. Uh-huh. Well, from what we can find out, sir, your wife's sister died three years ago. How could your wife be staying with her? Oh, all right, I suppose I might as well tell you about it. Doesn't seem to be any other way. All right, sir. Go right ahead. First off, my wife is not in the old country. She's not with her sister. What you heard is true. Uh-huh. Officer, what I have to tell you is very hard to say. I find it hard to find the right words. That's all right, sir. You just go ahead. We've been married for 30 years. 
30 years, man and wife, and, and then she did this. Almost broke my heart, officers. Is one of you married? Oh, yes, sir. My partner here is. Then you, you'd know what I mean. You'd know how it is. Sir? She left me. Packed her things and left. It didn't give me any reason. Just said she didn't want to be my wife anymore. She said she didn't want to share my roof. Just left. 30 years. All that time and she left. Well, what kind of terms were you and your wife on, sir? You, what do you mean, this, this term? Well, did you and your wife get along all right? Were you happy? You certainly. As I said, we were married 30 years. Yes, sir, I understand that. But did you ever have any quarrels? Sergeant, all married people have quarrels. Maybe the house isn't clean. Maybe dinner isn't big enough. Maybe the children get too loud. All married couples have quarrels. It's part of living together. Well, from what we understand, sir, some of the arguments you and your wife had were pretty serious. The people who said that are liars. Well, they seem pretty sure. Liars, that's what they are. Oh, sometimes maybe I'd forget myself, get a little loud, but serious never. How'd you get along with your children, Mr. Schroeder? <laughs> My children? Yes, sir, that's right. How'd you get along with them? All right, they were a little wild. All children over here are like that, wild. They don't respect their elders, but I got along good. There seems to be a difference of opinion on that, too, sir. We've heard that you and your children weren't on too friendly terms. And you believe this? You think that this is true? Mr. Friday, Mr. Smith, these were my own flesh and blood. I loved them, still do. Maybe that sounds hard to believe. I can imagine what you've heard, I know. I, I've heard about this before. I know who told you. You didn't think I'd know, but I do. It was Ella, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Who told us isn't important, sir? But it is. You see, this is very hard for me to say. Thirty years married, and it is all a mistake. I knew it from the start. She was a shrew, Mr. Friday. I, I knew it right away, a shrew. Sir? My wife, Bertha, almost from the day we were married, she was a nag. All I wanted in life was to do a day's work and come home and read the paper, maybe have a pipe of tobacco, rest, work, and have my home. Maybe someday when the children were grown, they'd say, Papa was good. He gave us a good house, and he was good. That's all I wanted. Yes, sir? Bertha didn't want that. Always wanted more. For the children, she said. When I wouldn't kill myself at work, she'd get angry, talk loud to me. All I wanted was peace. When the children came along, she taught them just like her. Now, how do you mean, sir? She taught them what a mean man I was, turned them against me, my own children, taught them to hate their father, their own father. Yes, sir. Well, why didn't you tell your children that your wife left you? No, Mr. Friday, I couldn't. This would break their hearts. They might hate me, but I don't want them to hate their mother. I couldn't do that. The Lord would never forgive me for that. Have you heard from your wife at all since she left? Not a word. I, I made up that letter so the children wouldn't find out. I couldn't have that. Did she take any money with her? Would you know that? Yes, she did. We have a joint account as a bank two blocks over. She made a large withdrawal the day she left. Well, Mr. Schroeder, why would you rent your house? It was sold by myself. The house was full of Bertha. All the things were hers. Everywhere I looked, I saw her. It hurt me, Mr. Smith. I had to get out, so I came here. It's not much, but I can read the paper and I'll then have a pipe of tobacco. It, it's peaceful. It's all I need. Mm -hmm. What'd you do with your wife's personal effects? I don't think I understand, Sergeant. Her clothes, the furniture from the house, things like that. They're in storage. I had some men come out and take all of it away, stored it away. I thought that maybe someday Bertha would come back and we could take up where we left off. Yes, sir. Could you give us the name of the storage company where you left the furniture? Mm, certainly. It's out on Pico. I can give you the address. Is that important? No, sir, not really. It's just something we ought to check. Don't you think it might be better if you told your daughter about all this or about what's happened? No, Mr. Smith, it wouldn't prove anything, nothing at all. Well, that's the way you want it, sir. There's nothing we can do about it. It's better, Mr. Friday, believe me, I know. If they hate me, there's not much I can do about it, but I don't want to bring them any unhappiness. I couldn't do that. Yes, sir. I'm 65 years old, Mr. Friday. I worked hard all that time, harder than most men. Had four children. They're all grown. They have families of their own. All this, and I've got nothing. Nothing but lonely days and empty nights. Yes. It's an awful thing, just awful. Sir? To work all your life and have nothing to show for it. One thirty-seven p.m. We got the address of the storage company from Henry Schroeder, and then Frank and I left to go back to the office. At this point, we had two stories. Both of them could be true. Both of them could be lies. There was no way of knowing. In the meantime, it was merely a matter of checking. Until it could be proved one way or the other, there was little action we could take. 2.15 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office, and I put in a call to the storage house. Yes, sir. I'll wait while you're checking, huh? 
I don't know, Joe. Sure seems like the old guy is telling the truth. Oh, well, we check this out, we'll know one way or the other. Such a nice little guy. Seems hard to believe that he'd do anything wrong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, what was that? Uh-huh. Could you tell me when? What was the name? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh-huh. Thanks very much. That's no, Joe Friday. F-R-I-D. Yeah. That's right. Michigan 5211, extension 2521. Right. All right, thanks again. How about it? He stored the furniture, all right. Yeah. I remembered him. Talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh huh. Told him to sell everything. We drove out to the storage house and talked to the owner. He said that Schroeder had called them out to pack the furniture and then he ordered it stored. A week later, he called back and told them to dispose of all the furnishings and personal effects. We called Schroeder's bank and they told us that there'd been no large withdrawals on the date of her disappearance. Also, she'd drawn no checks since. We got in touch with the other children and they verified their sister's story. They all said that the father was hard to live with and had on several occasions struck Mrs. Schroeder. They told us that it was possible that she had left her husband, but that she would certainly have gotten in touch with one of them if she had. They said that as far as they knew, Mrs. Schroeder was in good health and she was in good condition mentally. One of the daughters said that they were planning on a shopping trip to buy school clothes for one of the grandchildren. The woman went on to say that as far as she knew, Mrs. Schroeder would not have left without saying something to her about not being able to keep the appointment. We got in touch with Ella Randall. She said that she would like to accompany us when we talked to the neighbors of the Schroeder woman. She said that she could point out her mother's friends and that she would be able to trace her mother's movements about the neighborhood for us. 4.15 p.m., we picked her up. We talked to the neighbors and they told us of hearing loud voices coming from the house. They said that Mr. Schroeder was always angry at his wife and he made no attempt to hide it. 7.30 p.m., we went on to talk to the people who had rented the Schroeder home. Come on in. Thank you very much, Mr. Armstrong. It's my partner, Frank Smith. This is Mrs. Randall. Yes, Mrs. Randall, I've met before. How are you, Mrs. Randall? Uh, how are you, Mr. Armstrong? Well, what's this all about? We'd like to ask you some questions about the Schroeders, if we could. Well, Mrs. Randall here would be able to answer them better for you. They're her parents. Well, yes, sir. We'd like some information from you, if we could. All right, go ahead. Don't think there's much I can tell you. Did you see Mrs. Schroeder when you rented the house? No, come to think about it, I didn't. Mr. Schroeder talked about her, but I didn't see her when we took the house. Uh-huh. How'd Mr. Schroeder act when you rented the place? I don't think I understand. Well, did he seem upset? Anything at all unusual about him? As a matter of fact, there was. What was that, sir? Well, the house was kind of old. You know, paint missing from some of the woodwork. Some of the paper was a little faded. And we asked him if he planned to fix it up before we moved it. You know, if he'd foot the bill. Yes, sir, we understand. You know, right away, I kind of expected an argument. He just seemed like that kind of a guy. You know, who wouldn't spend a nickel he didn't have to. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like that. The smile, say anything that we wanted to have done. Real nice. Sure hasn't caused us any trouble. Of course, there's no reason for him to. We pay the rent on time, take care of the lawn, the flowers. I think we're pretty good tenants. Sure is a difference. Never looked like this when we lived here. I remember that Mama would ask him to paint the place a little. Always raise the roof. Said there wasn't any reason to do it. Said to wait until the kids were grown and, and appreciated a house. Not like that with us. Well, he was with his own family. Even when we were gone, after we left the house, he said that there wasn't any reason to fix the place up. Said that Mama and him were the only people who ever saw the inside of it, and it didn't matter to them. Like I said, couldn't ask for a better landlord. Well, I, I kind of hate to ask this. Yeah? Well, I, I wondered if, if I could see the rest of the house. I'd, I'd kind of like to see what he did to it. Well, I guess it's okay. It won't take too long. I better eat pretty quick. Got a bowl tonight. The team's playing the league championship tonight. Well, just a look. I won't keep you. Okay, well, you know the house? Yes. This is the living room. Bedrooms are down the hall. This is the dining room. Oh, pretty paper. It made Mama so happy to have this. Here's a bath. All new tile, just beautiful. Yeah, it makes it nice. Mm. It's a master bedroom. This was Papa's room. It sure is nice. Oh, look at the pretty curtains. Those are ours. We said he'd put drapes in every one of them. But oh. Sally, it's a wife. She likes curtains. Uh huh. I do too. Use this for the oldest boy. This was Mom's room. Oh, it's just beautiful. That's a beautiful carpet. Yeah, he put that in, too. Didn't even have to ask for that. It's own idea. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Mama always wanted it. The only room in the house that has it. Do you have a cellar in this house, Mr. Armstrong? Yeah. We use it for the freezer. Sally puts up canned goods in the summer. Keep them down there. I wonder if we could see it, please. Uh, sure, but there isn't any change down there. He didn't do anything with the cellar. Yes, yeah, sir. It's all right, though. We'd like to see it. 
Oh, sure. Like to make it fast, though. I gotta eat, you know. Yes, sir, we understand. It won't take very long here. Sure, it's down this way. Had to run electricity down there for the freezer. I guess he'd have done it, but it was just an extension cord. Thought about having it done permanently, but no real reason to. I understand. I'll go ahead and get the light. Yes, sir. You want to wait here, Miss Randall? Why? Well, no reason, ma'am. We just thought it might be better. Well, all right. I'll wait in the living room. All right, thank you. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Not very big, just room enough for the freezer and a few shelves. Uh-huh. Cement floor, huh? Yeah. Frank? Yeah? You want to swing that light up here? I want to check something here. Oh, sure. What's this room under, Mr. Armstrong? I mean, what's above it? Let's see. That'd be the master bedroom about to there. Uh-huh. The room next would begin there. Uh-huh. That'd be Mrs. Schroeder's room, wouldn't it? Mm, from what Mrs. Randall said, yeah. Uh-huh. You got a piece of paper, sir? I'd like to get up on the freezer. I don't want to scratch it here. Why, something you want? Well, I'd just like to look. I have a piece of paper, cardboard, anything, cloth. I don't see any. Go ahead. Just don't scratch your feet around. It'll be all right. All right, sir. All right, Frank. Swing the lighter, will we? Yeah. What is it, Joe? Well, I'm not sure. You got your flash? Yeah. Here you go. All right. Okay. What is it? What do you see up there? <laughs> we better call the crime lab and get him out here. What is it? Seep through the flooring up there. Yeah. Looks like blood. <laughs> listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. All over America, smokers are changing to Chesterfield because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. So remember, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. First and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> p.m. The crime lab was called and they came out to go over the place. A benzidine test was run on the stains and it was proved that they were blood stains. The carpet in the bedroom was removed and additional stains were uncovered. Frank and I checked the cellar floor, but it was solid and there was no evidence that any part of it had been torn up. A preliminary check was made of the yard, but we found nothing. The next morning at 7.58 a.m. we called the crime lab. They'd finished their investigation and told us that the stains were made by human blood. 8.10 a.m. Frank and I drove out to the house to continue our investigation. Boy, it's going to be a scorcher. Yeah, it looks that way. Did you check that corner of the yard over there? Yeah, doesn't look like anything's been disturbed. Well, let's talk to the neighbors again. There's got to be an answer someplace. Okay. You know, I'm going to tell Faye to get me some of those shirts with the holes in them. What do you mean, holes in them? You know, like they were back east. Little bitty holes between the material. That way you don't get so hot. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Joe. What? There's something on the grass over there by the rose bed. Oh, it's probably a locket or something. One of the kids dropped a toy, maybe. Yeah, I'll get it. Give it back to Armstrong. What do you got? Piece of dental bridge work. Looks like it's been in a fire. The crime lab was called, and they went over the backyard. They checked the incinerator, and under a large heap of ashes, they found several pieces of bone. They took a sample of the ash back to the lab to examine it. We got in touch with the daughter, Mrs. Randall. We got the address of Mrs. Schroeder's dentist. Frank and I drove out to talk to him. We showed him the piece of dental bridge work that we'd found, and he identified it as positively belonging to Mrs. Schroeder. He showed us the card from his files, which gave the date that he'd installed the bridge. 11.56 a.m., we called the crime lab, and Lieutenant Lee Jones told us that the ash and the particles of bone that he'd recovered could be of human origin. 12.15 p.m., we drove out to the apartment and took Henry Schroeder into custody. We talked to him in the interrogation room. I don't understand all this. None of it makes any sense. Well, it's pretty simple, Schroeder. Simple? You say that I killed Bertha and you say it's simple. How can you say that? Why do you say that? You must have a reason. I, I told you all I know. There's a couple of things you didn't tell the truth about, sir. What? 
You said that just before your wife left you, she made a large withdrawal from your account, didn't you? That's right, she did. She did take some money. Well, in checking your bank account, we found no record of any such withdrawal. You've got no right to go through my bank account. You've got no right. This is a murder investigation, Schroeder. We've got a right to clear it up. But she did take the money. She did. You've got to believe me. It's a little hard to do, Schroeder. Since your wife disappeared, she hasn't drawn any money out of your account. Before that, she drew checks to pay the local store bills. Now, how do you explain that? I can't. I can't. I, I, I don't know what you're trying to say. I, I, I don't know what you're trying to get me to say. We're trying to get you to say the truth, that's all. But I am. I am. You said you put all the furniture from your house in storage. Now, is that right? Yes, I said that. Mm -hmm. You said you wanted to keep it in case your wife came back and you two started all over again? Yes, that's the truth. We checked the storage company. They told us you called them and ordered everything sold. Told them to sell it as soon as possible. Now, how do you explain that? You're getting me so confused, I can't think. And we checked the house, the one where you and your wife lived. We found blood stains, lots of them. They're human blood. I, I don't know. I don't know. People who live there now said that you put a carpet over the floor. Only room in the house that has a carpet. They say it was your idea. I can't think. I, I, I don't know what you're saying. Well, here's a report here. Take a look at it. It's a list of the things we found in your incinerator. Things that were burned. Now, do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it to you? How about it, Schroeder? Schroeder? I didn't mean it. Thirty years. Thirty years married. I didn't mean to do it. I, I came home late. Real late. I'd, I'd been drinking. We had words. I hit her. I don't know what happened. I, I, I knew what I was doing. I kept hitting her. Then she was dead. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to. I, she turns the kids against me. Turned everybody against me. Thirty years, Mary. She turned everybody against me. I'm afraid you got it wrong, mister. Huh? You did that yourself. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, remember this. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that gives scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. So try Chesterfields today, either way, regular or king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Henry Rudolph Schroeder was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the State Penitentiary, San Quentin, California. <laughs> just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on the same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Music